Hello, I'm Carl Wells. My guest today is an artist. He is a supporter of causes, and he's a storyteller. I first met him many years ago when he was helping raise awareness about the plight of the Newfoundland pony. I also learned at that time that he is one of Newfoundland and Labrador's most prolific artists. And it's my pleasure to welcome my friend Clifford George to the program. Welcome. Good day, Carl. Nice to be here. Let's go back, way back to the beginning, and I want you to tell me about where you grew up in Newfoundland. I grew up in a little community called Whiteway, Trinity Bay, with no electric lights in 1958. 57, something around here. And, and what was it like there when you were growing up? It was fantastic growing up in that little community. We didn't know of anyone else, only the people that, you could almost tell what car went down the road by, by the tar tracks. There, there, there were that few at that time. Mm. And, and you help your elders all the time, you know. And you learn from your elders. Like, even my uncles taught me mm. not to go down, down the head to war, afraid I'd fall over, mm -hmm. and this and that, and everybody was giving you advice. Speaking of elders, tell me about your mom and dad. Well, my father met my mother in Greens Harbor, and they got married, and we lived happily with my grandfather and grandmother and grandmother's sister in the same old house in Trinity Bay. Yeah. They all lived together in the same house, boy, and did the same. Grandfather used to knit, uh, knit his twine in the hallway. You had to push to kick it out of your way to get into the hall, because he'd knit a cat trap or a leader in the winter for to go fishing in the spring, him and his brother. And well, did you come from a big, far big family? No, it was only two of us, myself and my brother Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. And was your father a fisherman? My father started off try, trying to be a fisherman, but my father did everything for a living. You know, he did everything. He lived, I, was, I would say he lived many lives. He, lived, he worked in lumber. What, he used to be gone away, and then he'd come home in the fall of the year and stuff like that, or go away in the spring and come back in the fall or go away in the winter. Worked yeah. in the corner brook in the lumber woods and stuff yeah. like that. He was a hard worker. Yeah. yeah. Well, you had to be He had to be a hard days. worker to provide. Yeah. And my grandfather worked, the, worked at the fishery. And he'd, oh, we all lived in the one house. We lived on codfish and stuff like that, you know. Stuff we had ourselves provided. A lamb was killed. It was shared by all the people on the hill where we lived. It's no such thing as putting it in a deep freeze. It was all passed out freely among neighbors, right? That's the way we lived. Um, now, Cliff, did you come? You're known as a storyteller. I'm just wondering, did you come from a family of storytellers? See, when I was a young fella growing up, see, everyone in the community walked around in the dark in the night. There, there was no lights on the poles. Now, you hear the horses chewing on the side of the road. You had to wiggle your way through somehow so they wouldn't tread on you or something like that. But you had respect for the horses. But uh, people that walked from one community to the other, I used to walk to Green Cyber when I got older in the night time. But my father used to come home and tell stories. He always telling the stories. My father was a great storyteller. And he always told stories about when he was coming down over to Rankies in Green Cyber. How he, how he, uh, a lady, this story was known as Esau's woman. A woman caught and hold by the hand by the old railway track and, and led him down to the bridge. And once she got to the bridge, she let his hand go. Stuff like that, you know. Mm. And, and, and Uncle Arch Golden was a man that lived in Woodway. I didn't know him, but my father knew me. He used to sit down on a rock Sunday evening and tell my father and him stories about how he went to the land of the Smoky Mountains fishing. That's Norway. You know, them fellas, they went away in them, them boats and came back. They had tons of stories. The land of the Smoky Mountains. Well, that's what he called the land of the Smoky Mountains. That Norway. Was the, Norway, mm. yeah. And he used to tell my father stories about the old woman who couldn't get her pig to market. I had to get a pig to market before midnight, and father used to tell me them stories. And I remember them all. And then I listened to other people telling stories. I used to be spellbound with stories, because back then, fairies and ghosts were part of our lives. And until this day, when I tell the story about fairies and ghosts, I tell it as if it's real. Because to me, it's real, because I heard it from real people years ago. Mm. There was no televisions. It was all of a storytelling. So where, where would they tell these stories? At home if, you were, if you were in somebody else's house and it started getting dark, yeah. you tried to frighten the living daylight out of you before you went home. <laughs> you know? So one, one fellow used to come and get his sheep in the fall of the year. You know, his sheep ran free. And he used to say to us, now, boy, you, you better get them sheep first. We, we, we'd have stitches on our side running them through the woods trying to catch the sheep. He said, because I got to get home before dark. Well, we said, well, well, you got to get home before dark. He said, because the fairy's coming down. He said, jumped in the box cart. 
coming up that hill there by the Rankies. He said, <laughs> they jumped up my box car. They said, there was another man in the car. They said, I couldn't get to the top of the hill in time. He said, I thought the horse was never going to make it. But when they got to the bridge, they don't cross the water, said Clifford, he said. So they jump off there, and all the horses will come on down there. But he said, they say if you, if you see yourself or you see a token before dark, that's okay. But if you don't catch them sheep before dark, and I see my token going up, that means I'm going to die the next day. So, so we rush and everything trying to catch the sheep. <laughs> And the token for the those token who was don't a know is a ghost. Yes, it's a, so a token of yourself. If you see yourself, a symbol oh. of yourself. And one old fellow told me about the shadows. You know, I walked the Green Arbor a good many nights. I was scared to death. I used to have a girlfriend in Green Arbor, and I'd walk four miles up there to, to see her and come home. And if I see a dry stump on the side of the road, I used to be I used to cross myself about five times. <laughs> very afraid there was a ghost or something. You know. <laughs> so that's where the stories came from. So for all the would-be storytellers out there, yeah. what is the secret to telling a really effective story? The secret is listening mm. and believing in it. Like, like Uncle Gabe told me the story about, I, I was told a story about Uncle Gabe that went fishing early in the morning. And when he used to go fishing, he used to take his big Clydesdale horse to put under the flake. And he put her under the flake to eat the chickweed, see, while he was gone fishing. And he heard up in the store laugh, you fetch, I fetch. And, he, and he'd, be, he'd be sort of, he didn't know what it was. He said, somebody's making fool of me this morning, you know. And then he'd go down to the boat. And in the evening, he went to go up and jiggy squid. So he'd take his horse back when he came back, put her back in the stable. But every time he put her back in the stable, he'd hear that voice, you fetch, I fetch, see? So, so uh, this night, he went to put his horse, he went down to, to, to go out in the jigging hole to get some squids, see? He had to get some squids for to put on his trial the next morning. So his brother was in the house, so he said, I'll go up and jig the squid. So when he went to put on his rubber clothes, his rubber clothes was on his brother's cloak, and his clothes was on, on uh, you know, they had him switch, somebody switched his rubber clothes and their boots. So he said, boy, something going on here. You know, and then he heard them voices again, you fetch, I fetch. So he went to put his boot down on the boat to go up in the jigging hole to jig his squids. And when he did, the boat went down to put a foot. Somebody else put their foot there. Oh. A, a, a fathom or a token. <laughs> put their foot there first. So he had to get in the boat. When he got in the boat now, he heard chains rattling in the boat. And he says, well, somebody in the boat with me. It's not good. Well, let me tell this whole story. Yeah. It takes a while. Anyway, he put his foot in the boat and, 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 he, and he felt the spirit was in the boat with him. So he said, I got to get the spirit in the boat or I won't be jigging any squid this evening. So he went up and he went into Pippi's dock in the beach and he said to the spirit, now, boy, I don't know who you are or what you are, but get out of my boat now. So he went into the land wash. And when, he buddied, when the spirit jumped out of his boat, he heard the beach rock scrumble in the chain. He was rattling, going up the beach. And he pushed the boat off and went out in the jigging hole. Before he got to the jigging hole, he only had a skull out to the jigging hole. When he got to the jigging hole, he looked back. And boy, you never believe what he saw. He saw his own brother waving back at him, up to the end of the beach. So he said, I won't tell my brother anything about that. Yeah. I'll keep that to myself, he says. So the next morning he wakes his brother, they got the trial bait it now to go, 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 go out to catch some fish out on the fishing grounds, right? So he goes out on the fishing grounds and uh, he's thinking about it. Old Gabe is thinking about his brother Selb, see? By God, he said, you know, he said, Selb's all right, he's all right, it's not going to happen to Selb. Day, he's going to be just as good as I am, right? He said, he, he, he looks sick, he don't look sick or anything. So they, 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 they put the trial out, and they, the, the, the way you do it on the fishing grounds, you come back then from the trial grounds to, to, the, to where, where you go fishing for a hand line. So they hand line for an hour till the trial got baited up with cod. So they said, just go back down and haul the trial. We'll go back and haul the trial now, boy. He said, so boy. Oh, Gabe said, so he goes out on the trial grounds, see? And he said, keep her over, keep her over, Gabe, boy, keep her over. He said, keep the boat over, keep her coming straight. I see the boy right there. He said, the trawl boy was a, a top on top of a stick with a big long boat like thing that went down to the bottom of the ocean to the trawl. So when he went, he went to grab the <coughs> trawl like that, he went to grab the boy. Funny thing, he said, Gabe, boy, that boy is not there. Funny, he said, about the omen on the water, how it tricks you sometimes. Mm -hmm. Funny thing, Gabe, boy, what happened then? He turned around, guess what happened then? He died and hid the boat, just like that. And his brother had to bring it in and land him. And the minister came down on the wharf and pronounced him dead and everything. So that's it. I can't tell if you're telling the truth or not. <laughs> I well, suppose it does, me, that it was, doesn't matter with a good story. It was story. told to me by Mr. Jet Harnum <laughs> when I was a boy. <laughs> Uncle Jet Harnum told me that story. Yeah. And when I tell it, the boy says, Clifford, you didn't get anything wrong. You told it just like he told it. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, I suppose we should talk about your art. Now, I'd like to know how and when you first discovered that you could draw or you, you liked yeah. to draw. Well, my mother told me that uh, the minister used to come to the house for his breakfast in the morning, see? That was a tradition because he, he used to come off from Harris and used to walk to church. And he, and he said to me, are you going to church? I said, Mom, Mom, my mother told me this. I said, no, you can go on yourself because I'm drawn. And I was drawing a duck on the floor and a horse and stuff like that, see? Mm. So uh, I saw that and grandfather used to say, say to me, I said, show me how to draw a, a, a duck or a horse. And he'd do it like a stick duck and I'd catch on to it. But father was talented. My father could draw a duck, he could draw a horse, he could draw anything. He used to draw pictures on the blackboard, you know. We went down at the times in the school to make people laugh and stuff like that. So I decided, I didn't decide, I, I knew that that's all I wanted to do was draw. And I, I loved drawing horses because we had horses and stuff like that. And that's mm. all, and then I got into paint and painting pictures and I used to paint Titanic. Jeez, I love, people used to say, you, I'll give you $5 for a picture of Titanic to give me a piece of cardboard. And I had enough house paint around, you know, I used to get the house paint from people painting their house. I had enough house paint and I'd get enough black and that and enough blue to make the water and everything. And I'd paint the, horse, the, the Titanic for $5 and there was no lights. So I get in the kitchen, but that was only young then. Mm. And grandmother says, not time to light the lamp yet, Clifford boy. You can't light the lamp yet. Mm. And I said, but I can't see how to put the windows in the Titanic. <laughs> but I have to wait till it was time for the, when it got completely dark, she'd light the lamp. <laughs> yeah, I suppose things haven't changed that much today. If you have a, po if you have a popular subject yeah. to paint, people want to buy it. Yeah, well, I, I uh, find that uh, I've been lucky, like not lucky, but uh, most of my life that uh, if I painted something, mm. somebody liked it and wanted to buy it, right? But, but now, yeah. you went to the College of the North Atlantic, I suppose it was College called of Trades and Technology. Colli College of Trades and Technology yeah. then. And Bill McLaughlin taught me. So what did you take, commercial art? I took commercial art. Bill McLaughlin went to the, Nova, the, the Newfoundland Academy of Art with Helen Shepard and Red Shepard. That's right, on Longs Hill. Yeah, so he taught me, when he got me into class, I, I learned commercial art and d d do the whole bit about advertising and how to sell yourself and how to sell stuff for uh, borrowings downtown and ears and stuff like that, you know, all of the outlets, because that's what you had to do. And all the ads in the newspapers was done by artists. That's right, yeah. We learned all that. Yeah. And then he said, you got special talent. So he said, I'm going to put my emphasis on it with your painting. So he went, what, what, what I got. when he started giving me a few pointers, that's when my yeah. That's when my activity and my creativity come alive then. Yeah. How long was that program then? Nine months. No, oh, just nine months? Nine months. Well, in nine months, we had to go to the Newfoundland Museum. We sketched everything in the city. Yeah. And we'd come in and put our pictures up on the board, and then the principal would come down and buy them, or the vice principal or something yeah. like that. Uh, now, tell me about the first job you got after well, college. Well, I went into uh, E.C. Boone Advertising, right. my first art that job. Yeah. And Mr. Boone said to me, great old man boy, Ernie Boone, my gee, my son, you couldn't meet any better, see? And I didn't know he was going to hire me on. He said, do you read the newspaper? I said, no, not likely. Well, he said, if, you're going to, if you go to work here, you've got to know what's going on. You've got to read the newspaper every day because mm -hmm. you're going to be a neon illuminated sign designer if you get the job here. So he continued on. He said, what do you got in that bag there? Well, I said, that's me clothes I got there. I, go, I worked on a Janeway, a janitor work, night, down night time from... 5.30 to 11 o'clock. Well, he said, throw that in the garbage now, because you're going to work here. And he hired me on. I did the signs you, for London, so New York, and Paris. And a neon... Uh, an uh, illuminated uh, sign designer. So, uh... You no, see, you ever go in the mall and you see them signs with the halos around the letters years ago and all that yeah, stuff? That's the yeah. Kind of, I, I was, that was brilliant. So, uh, Jeez, that was the best job. That was better in, in, in the faculty of medicine, that was. Yeah, a neon sign, is, is, it's like tubing. Yes, but this With, time, but then it got invented where there was tubing underneath raised letters off of the, off of the, off of the fascias right. on buildings and everything, yeah. right? Like the London, New York, and Paris. I designed that one. Did you? Yes, sir. And I wow. did Kitchen Queen downtown, all them big signs. Yeah. At one time, we had a sign for Con Cornwall Drugs up on top of the road, up, on, uh, up there around wherever, well, Hamill Abbey or somewhere. And it got turned down, so it was a pile on side, and it got to four sided. It got turned down because it wasn't attached to the building. So Mr. Boone said, so he turned us down, look at that. Therefore, what are you going to do now? He said, all that work. I said, so I took a piece of angle on it, on the plan, 
And I ran it into the car in the building and bowled it onto the building in my design and I got past it. He went down and bought me a watch. Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the fuck thinking about getting doing it. Yeah. P&R Auto Body, American Motors came out and rode all them big old signs by. Yeah. And it was fun going driving through the city looking at them lit up. I bet it was. I phoned Dave Boone the other day. He's the one left now. Dave still run that business. Yeah. I said, Dave, we got to talk about your father, boy. And the good old days, right? Yeah. Because I called the Boone Training Academy. Mm. But they never paid big money. But I, uh, Shirley and I managed to live. Mm. And then I said, I got to get out of this. Because there's no pension here, right? Mm. So I watched for t watched in telegrams. They watched for ads. This day, buddy, this ad came out, Carl, boy. Won it. An artist at Memorial University. So I goes over to the Faculty of Medicine, T and T9, in over temporary buildings. Remember them, the temporary buildings? Yes, I do, yeah. I started I, in them. <laughs> did you? Yeah. yeah, well, anyway, boy, I goes over there and walks into the building, and I meet this man, Dr. Dr. Payton, Dr. Brian Payton from England. What a, what a treat. Mm -hmm. and, I, and there was 21 employees for a job, and, and I, my portfolio was that big that I had to go out a second time to get a car to bring it all in, right? So then he said to me, he said, Clifford, he said, we'll let you know. So I wasn't home not an hour before they phoned. He said, you got the job. Now you had probably one of the most interesting jobs, um, unusual jobs that, that an artist could have, I think. Just tell us what it was that you had to do in, in your See, work as I an artist. I was so fortunate, and in my life, so fortunate and happy that I met all the pioneers that came here to teach medicine. Mm. They came here to teach medicine from all over the world. Like, like Mr. Smallwood said, we're going to have Lord Taylor, we're going to have this one, we're going to have You know, I, I met doctors that were unbelievable teaching, teaching medicine in there. And them doc they didn't want to copy other people's books. Dr. Thomason, the head of anatomy, professor of anatomy, he, gave, he got me to do neuro, the neurology, the, the, you know, the neuro, the neurology drawings, not neurology, the neuroanatomy all the neuroanatomy drawings for his textbooks of the human body, the human brain. I had to draw all the superficial layers, the deep layers of the foot, the, the muscles in the legs, the toes, and the whole brain was sliced up for me and frozen and sliced up for me to draw and illustrate. I, I got the book at home now that he used every time that students went to medical school to use my book. So you were drawing cadavers. Yeah, drawing cadavers. People who donated their bodies to legs science. Legs and arms and brains yeah. and everything. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you, the first time I went in there, Dr. Payton said, Clifford, I'm going to take up my anatomy. Now, I didn't know where that was, Carl. I, said, I worked in the fish plant one time, right? You know, yeah. I, I did. I would know I was in this mansion. That's what it was, the med new medical school. And Dr. Payton called me into this room, boy. And there was dead bodies and pieces of legs and arms everywhere, right? And I said, oh, rubber, rubber, rubber anatomy, rubber. They made it a rubber, those people. That's what they looked like, you know, so I was saying to myself. And then I saw Dr. Shakti Chandra. She was there cutting somebody's back and had all the muscles layered off, you know? And this one I hit the floor. I fainted there. Why was it that they wanted drawings as opposed to a photograph? Well, see, if you take a photograph, you've got to pull the muscles and blood, and, and, and not blood, but you've got to pull a mass of everything. But if, if I draw it, I, I, I breaks it up, like the muscles, I let them come out from the body and stuff like that. So you could, if you're going to do the pictorial muscles and everything like that, you, you, you do them in such a form that the students know all about them, because they're going to be, they're, they're going to be studying the human body anyway. So I had to draw it in a, in a, in a uniform, in a way that it explained what it was all about and it simplified it. You know, like one time I had to draw a stomach and somebody's pancreas and the, and the veins were growing into the pancreas, circular like an old tree root, right? So this, they said, this man should have died because of that, but he didn't, he died from something else, so they were intrigued, and they wanted to publish it. So they brought in a tray, that big by that big, with all the Utah, everything in it, and put it down there and said, okay, now clever, draw that. So at first I did, did it in like, a, like I learned in art school, you know, I did it in shading and all that kind of stuff, and, 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 and graphite. Then I put a big sheet of uh, film over the top of it. Then I traced it off in pen and ink, and then I labeled the whole part what it all was. And then after that, the photographer took it, and then it got photographed on Cotelet film, and then it got published in a book. Mm. And I, of course, these instructors were telling you all along what to do. Yeah, I they suppose. were explaining it to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they told you what they needed, essentially. Yeah, they, they were good about it. Yeah. Now, Dr. Hannah was something. She, he, he could draw too, see. Hannah was a bit of an artist, right? And he's all right. I used, I used to see Hannah in the middle of the night walking up the highway with a big old Parker going, you know, hanging down over his back. 
Where are you going, Dr. Hanna? Boy, they can't even do a appendix in here now unless it gets me to come in. They were the pioneers, see. Mm. So, Clifford, what would people say when you, when you told them what you did for a living? Well, maybe they what, wouldn't. What, well, what, people, people, people didn't believe me anyway. You know, a lot of people didn't even believe it. You know, like my father came into my office one day and he said, what you got in that five-gallon bucket there? I said, brains. Well, he said, brains? And then I took the cover off, showed him the brains. He, he believed me then. <laughs> <laughs> he believed me, believed me after that. But he had tremendous... He didn't faint, did he? No, he had tremendous, no. tremendous respect for yeah, for what you were doing, right? I did a yeah. lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of operations, but I yeah. did I did stomach operations, and I could I could tell when there's something wrong with your stomach or what's wrong with you now just by listening to you, because there's a certain blockage. It's like you can have an overlap bowel in your sleep, and you get a blockage in your bowel. Well, I used to have to draw the bowel with the blockage, and then draw the bowel after, and the colon and the stomach, and how they took 100 centimeters out, took the part that was had cancer or whatever, the blockage, or the overlap bowel, and then show how it was sewed up again, and then they published that, see? Yeah. I did some, I did some interesting work. Uh, well, it sounds like it. And when I got the kidney cancer the other day, see, the doctor in there was showing me where I had the kidney. He said, I'm not going to explain to you where the cancer is. You go and look at the x-ray yourself, so the, 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 the scan, right? CAT scan. And I'll go see it. Plans day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Clifford, uh, before we run out of time, I yeah. want to ask you about the Newfoundland Pony. Now, when you and I met many years ago, you were fighting on behalf of the Newfoundland Pony, which was in danger of disappearing. Uh, how, how did you get involved with the Newfoundland Pony in the beginning? Well, see, my father bought me a pony when I was 15. That came, he became a stallion. That's a long story, right? Big long story. But I fell in love with the pony, and the pony fell in love with me. We fought. We did everything together, right? You know, he did, he did a lot of damage in some places, and he was a good old pony. I kept him. Anyway, then, I, I went, I, then the pony started to disappear on the island. And, and it was three to 4,000 in 1987. Well, the meat trucks were taking them out. See, they were going to Quebec, they were going to Japan for human consumption, but there was some hard to explain to people that their ponies weren't going for dog food, they were going to be eaten by other people in other countries, right? So Dr. Fraser came to the medical school, Dr. Andrew Fraser, an animal vet and, and a teacher of, of animal medicine. And he, uh, he, asked, he asked me if we'd buddy up and save the Newfoundland pony. So he put down the half of me and all the illustrations I had and the paintings, he put them in his book. And the first book was Horse Twilight. But in 1992, there was only 500 ponies now. In 1997, there was only about 60 to 100. So I ended up trying to save the ponies. I, I did a lot of queer things. Eh? Like Tom Hughes used to get money from Canadian Farm and Animal Care Trust. He's deceased. He gave the first monies to Newfoundland to help save the ponies. And he used to coach me as to the meat truck. You gotta stop that meat truck. You gotta stop that meat trade from going off that island and ponies, right? So the time you were down at my show at Christina Parker's, that was the show, and then I got an Ottawa citizen. Mm -hmm. I'm right up. And they, they were told about the ponies leaving Newfoundland for meat. The blood flows through Newfoundland pony veins like it flows to the Newfoundlanders, that's what I said. And then they phoned Guelph College, phoned Newfoundland the University in place and said, phoned people here, what are you doing sending them ponies out for meat? So we got a law, they passed a law to protect Newfoundland ponies. You had to get a permit to ship them out. That was a good thing. That was a good thing. We got that passed, but now that's all gone. Now it's the same as ever that way. They got that scrap now. We won't get into that. They got that scrap. So the ponies can still go out now, but they're doing fantastic work, we got to say. They're doing fantastic work in the Newfoundland Pony Society to try to save our ponies. But I nearly died trying to save the ponies. I went through hard times trying to save the ponies. So, I'm just trying to get my head around it. Is, is horse meat considered to be a delicacy in some countries? Yes, I dare say it is in Japan and France. Yeah. Yeah. So just they can't imagine get enough drinking of the... a bottle of your wine that you made yourself yeah. over in France yeah. with, with your Newfoundland pony. Yeah. That would be pretty sad. So they can't get enough horse meat in their own countries. So To eat 100,000 Preswalski horses in France. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the Newfoundland pony apparently is a delicacy. That's what they say. Now, I wouldn't eat a Newfoundland pony, but, yeah. but uh, to fight, to play, uh, Jane Arden is fighting now, the actress, mm -hmm. to try and save horses from coming to the United States, to Canada, to be slaughtered, because in the United States, part of the states is outlawed, mm -hmm. that they can't slaughter ponies there. 
So they're bringing them in double-decker trucks and triple-decker trucks across the border to Canada to have them slaughtered. And our Newfoundland ponies right now, mm -hmm. even though they're registered and everything, there's no law says that they can't, they can't go for meat. Meat is a, is a legitimate trade in Canada. It's a, it's a business. It's a federal business. So it's mm -hmm. still on the go. Mm -hmm. uh, Clifford, I, I want to get back to, to the art and ask you if, if you had any mentors in art over the years, if there were people that you tremendously admired or who, who influenced you, respected, yeah. Well, Wally Brands, Wally Moore Brands mm -hmm. was the man that inspired me more than, more than anyone, I would say. Yeah. You know, and then, then, you, then when I was out around the Bay, I didn't know any Wally Moore Brands, but when I came into the city, I met all of them people, like Ray Perlin, you know, Daphne yes. House, and people that are gone, they're all gone. You know, like Jerry Squires, they were, he was my friend. I went down to dinner with a star. You goes down to a dinner with a star, right? First night I went down and looked around the room like this, but geez, I was some sad. Because they were all gone. The mentors that helped me were all gone. The only one was left was Jerry and JC down there. Mm. And we used to go down to the bar and then get loaded, me and, me and Jerry, before we went. <laughs> they used to give us triples downstairs <laughs> in the hotel. <laughs> but but uh, he's gone too now. Yeah. But Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh was one of my favorites, and Constable, Monet. Yeah. But uh, when we're talking Newfoundland Renaissance, we got to talk about Wally Brands. Yeah. Uh, people like that. Yeah. Harold Goodrich. And uh, Wally Branch, uh, for people who may not recognize the name, was a graphic artist at CBC Television for many years, but he also painted, did oil paintings himself yeah. and watercolor. Yeah. Um, he influenced so many people. But he was a great artist, yeah. 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 Uh, Clifford, we're out of time, unfortunately. As quick as that. As quick as that. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Yeah. And uh, good luck. Thanks for Good million. painting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I paint every day on location, when I can. Thank you very much for being with us. And that's it for this edition of Carl Wells Point to Point. Convenience Marie's Money Mart is here for you. A one stop shop for a variety of products, homestyle bread, sandwiches, plus check out our freshly baked artisan breads and single serve desserts exclusively at our in store bakery on Frecker Drive. With 25 locations wherever you go, there we are. If you have a comment about this program, we'd love to hear it. Email or call us or send us your feedback through social media. Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy DC and I am the Thursday night host of St. John's Local Tradition Out of the Fog. You know, local matters here on the show and from arts and business, not for profit, anybody doing anything great to make our province a more rewarding place to live and work. It all happens right here in the studio. So join me and my boy DJ Slim Macho every Thursday night for Out of the Fog. Carl Wells, getting ready to record another edition of Carl Wells Point to Point. It's a program where I chat with members of our community and they talk candidly about their lives and careers from their earliest dreams to their greatest triumphs. I think you'll find it informative and entertaining. Please join us for Carl Wells Point to Point right here on Rogers TV.